Marchintosh is almost over for 2024, so let's end this month with these last three models in the lineup of Apple's Compact Max. We have restored them in previous videos, but they are of course broken, so let's fix them today. The Macintosh Classic to the left has a bad diskette drive, the Classic 2 in the middle has a cap issue and a dead drive, the Color Classic to the right has a weird issue with the image. I was sure I knew what the fault was in the previous video, but I was wrong. So let's see if I'm right this time. I had some extra time this week, so in this video we are also going to play around with some external SCSI drives for these Macs. This video is sponsored by PCBWay. More on this later, thank you PCBWay for supporting this channel. Let's start with what I think is the easiest repair, and that's the Macintosh Classic here, with a bad drive. That means we need to open up the Classic 2 first, because I think we swapped the drives. I have covered the power connector on this Mac with some tape, because it doesn't have any caps. I wasn't planning to restore this Mac in that previous video, so I wasn't prepared with all the caps I needed. And the usual disclaimer applies. Please don't poke around inside CRT displays and power supplies. They may be charged with high voltages, even with the cord unplugged. With the screws out, we can push the entire system out just by pushing on the connectors. That should be enough to then pull the Mac out. And sure enough, that is a diskette drive from the Macintosh Classic. And the hard drive is missing. Let's pull that board out. I don't actually know if this board works, since it came with leaky caps, I never actually turned the machine on. But from what I can see here it looks really clean, so let's hope those caps didn't damage anything on the board. To get the drive cage out we need to remove four screws from underneath the Mac. Let's open up the Macintosh Classic next and return that working diskette drive to the Classic 2. These machines are almost identical except for the motherboard. This Mac has a RAM expansion card. I think we may have snatched it from the Classic 2. I'm gonna have to rewatch that video to find out. We have recapped the motherboard, so this is a working machine. This board is very clean too, and that is because we have washed it and installed a fresh set of red caps. And the same procedure to take that drive cage out. I was very lucky with these two Macs. They had gone all yellow on the outside, but inside they were both in incredibly nice condition. Well, except for the leaky caps. And two bad drives, of course. Okay, let's see how this drive behaves. Yeah, something is definitely wrong here. Yeah, I can't really insert the diskettes. It doesn't go all the way in. Yeah, that drive is bad. Let's see if we can fix it. Okay, let's have a look inside. Uh, see what might be wrong here. Let's insert the diskette and see what's going on here. Yeah, something is jammed. Oh, here we go. So eventually the diskette went in. But it's very slow to come out. And it's actually going back in slowly. Something is definitely wrong here. It's been a little while since I was inside one of these. Let's see if I remember. I think this is the first part that needs to come off. And then I think we need to release these springs here. One on each side. And now this piece comes out. I actually think this drive came this clean. I don't think I have cleaned it, aside from perhaps blowing out some dust. Well, this piece is moving freely, so this is not our issue. So how about this piece here? Well, it sort of moves, but I have to use quite a lot of force. So let's remove the gearbox and have a look inside. Yeah, look at how clean everything is. Someone bought this machine back in the 80s and forgot to use it. Let's have a look inside. Well, the cheese cog has gone yellow. But it seems to be moving freely. 
So I think it's okay too. Well, in that case, I'm just gonna grease the gearbox with some PTFE. I'm trying not to get this stuff all over my bench. I'll put this cog back in and put the lid back on. Well, this piece is clearly moving freely, but I think it would be silly not to grease it anyways. It's held in place with these plastic washers. Rather unusual. I don't think I have seen locking washers like this anywhere else actually. Uh, now we can remove this piece here and clean the old grease off. There is also some grease here and on these four tabs. We'll clean it off too and replace it. It's really nice to work on something this clean for once. It's definitely not always the case on this channel. We might as well clean the worm shaft and lube it. Well, it's easy to access. This drive only has one rail. So let's put some grease on it too. I'll reapply some grease on all these parts. And then we can put this piece back on. Let's put some underneath those washers too. This is PTFE, so it's not going to damage the plastics. Okay, said and done. In that case, the problem must be with this part here. I can't really see anything obvious. I'll remove this spring here and see if it moves freely. Well, sort of. But this whole thing is put together with rivets, so we can't take it apart. The only thing I can do is to remove as much grease as possible and apply some fresh grease. So the tricky bit here is not to make a bloody mess of the entire drive. So I'm gonna have to try to clean up the excess grease as I go here. But I think that actually made a small difference. So I think we're on the right track here. I'll just keep doing this. So I'll keep applying grease and cleaning the excess off until it moves freely. Okay, I skipped ahead here. That totally fixed it. Now everything moves freely. So this was most likely the problem with this drive. Let's put that spring back on. I think we need to apply some grease on here too. And reassemble the drive. I'll reattach these springs. Okay, let's try with the disc. Yeah, that totally works. Uh, now it ejects very easily. So that totally fixed it. I should probably replace that cheese cog too. But I'm curious to see how long it will last. I think this cog here needs to be repositioned. But we can't turn it without removing this cog. Otherwise we risk damaging one of the cogs. I think it needs to be in this position here. Let's find out. Well, it fits. I'll reconnect the eject motor. Uh, we're ready for a test. Okay, let's turn the Mac on. Uh, that was weird. The worm shaft starts spinning. Yeah, that drive is not fixed. Something is wrong here. But the eject works. And the diskette is now very easy to insert. But something is messed up here. Huh. Before we continue, I'd like to say thank you to PCB Way for sponsoring this video. I have been using their PCBs for years now, and I'm really happy with the level of service and the quality of these PCBs. This is just a few of the projects we have built on this channel. So head over to PCBWay.com and order some PCBs for your next project. Thank you PCBWay for supporting this channel. So the motor was spinning and the worm shaft was turning, but the heads wouldn't move. So perhaps those heads are stuck. Let's insert a diskette and then gently see if we can move those heads. 
Oh, they are really badly stuck. <laughs> yeah, they are jammed in old grease. Okay, so I'll do some more cleaning of the worm shafts and this rail here and see if I can make it move freely. Yeah, that grease had turned into glue. So I cleaned it up and applied some fresh grease. So now if I gently pull on this side here, I can move the heads back and forth freely. So let's try again. Okay, the disc spins up. Ah, uh, yes, and the heads are moving. And our Mac now boots. Now let's eject that disc. Yep, totally works. So the first Mac fixed. Okay, let's move on to the Classic 2. I thought I had washed this board because it looked so clean, but apparently I haven't washed it. I must have put some effort into cleaning up the flux after I had removed all the caps. So I found this machine in storage with leaky caps and obviously removed them to avoid damaging the board. So that's why this board doesn't have any caps. Oh, that's way too much light. Yeah, that's much better. I didn't bother making a list of what cap goes where because there already is a list on recap a Mac. I obviously didn't have all the values needed to recap it right away. But that has been taken care of. So these first two are 1 microfarad 50 volt caps. I'm trying out one of my new tips for the pine sill. I thought this tip would be perfect for this. And I was right. I don't remember the name of this tip. But I'll check and write on the screen. So it's quite tiny and it has a small flat surface. So it will take some solder and with a good flux on the board. I can just put that blob on the cap. Nice and easy for recapping SMD caps. Next up we have three 47 micro 16 volts. This is a very common value. So I always keep these in stock. This tip is perfect for this job. So the Classic 2 was the last compact Mac that had a black and white display. And also the last desktop Mac that had an external floppy connector. So perhaps we can use this Mac here to fill up the original hard disk 20 for my earliest Macs since it also has SCSI we should be able to connect both drives and transfer some files quickly and easily and period correct the last 47 micro cap is a bit hard to solder because there is barely any room to reach this pad here okay let's try this without melting any connectors yeah it's just about reachable I'm skipping ahead here so this is actually the last cap. Oh, this is really tight too. Let's not burn that connector. Okay, we're done. I'll double check all the values and polarity and clean up that flux off camera. Okay, everything checked out good. Before we test the board, let's install one of these CR2032 toasters. Uh, let's check the polarity. It goes in this way, and then the original lid goes on top, like so. Very simple, but great project. I guess that means it's time for a test. I'll connect the diskette drive and power it to the board. Okay, let's flip the switch. Okay, we've got the bong and the cursor. And a question mark. Perfect. It seems to work. Now let's try to boot. Oh no, we've got a sad Mac. Let me check that error. Okay. Apparently that means can't read system file. So let's clean those heads. 
Well, the cleaning biscuits. Uh, let's run it a couple of times. And uh, try again. <laughs> no, same error. Oh, just realized. Maybe that system disk is too old. Yeah, this is system one. <laughs> it probably won't work on this machine. Let me see what I can find. Okay, let's try this disk instead. Welcome to Macintosh. Awesome. Okay, great, so it's working. But this Mac isn't quite fixed yet. Because this Mac here came with this 40 meg Connor drive. And unfortunately it's dead. The closest I could get is this much larger 350 meg Quantum drive. So it will have to do. It seems to already have System 7 installed. Let's try it out and see if it works. I'm an optimist, so let's install it proper right away. These machines are quite easy to work on and easy to fix. I also think they made quite a few of these, so prices aren't too bad on eBay. They're also quite reasonably fast. So if you want to try out a compact Mac, these machines may be a really good option. The only thing you can expect having to fix are the caps on the logic board and in some cases on the analog board too. Depending on what brand of caps Apple used manufacturing that specific machine. On this machine here all the caps on the analog board are still good. I'll recap it when and if it's needed. There's no need to go old school with a real SCSI drive. You can just use a blue SCSI and make life much easier. But that's not my style, is it? Okay, let's test that drive. Well, it spins up and it's noisy. Oh, I think I left the disc in the drive. Yes, I did. So let's get that disc out. Welcome to Macintosh. Yes, that is a working drive. And as my note said, it seems to have System 7.1 installed. Okay, great. Then I'd say this Mac is fixed too. That brings us to number three here. The weird and wonderful Color Classic. Now, this one is a bit more tricky. I'll start by turning it on and see if it works at all. Sometimes it does, but sometimes it doesn't. And we're getting something on the screen. Okay, it seems to be working today. I'll leave it on for a moment and see if it starts misbehaving. Otherwise I'm gonna have to snatch some footage from my previous video. But let's wait a moment and see. Hello YouTube, I am Macintosh Color Classic. Well, unfortunately, I've been running the system for about 45 minutes and it still works. Which normally would be a good thing. But it sucks when you troubleshoot the system that you know is faulty. Well, the problem with this Mac is that sometimes the image starts moving. Sometimes it goes black screen. And sometimes it works perfectly like it does right now. Well, let's get inside this Mac and I'll show you what we have done so far. Getting the logic board out from this machine is much easier than on the Classic and the Classic 2. The logic board had leaky caps too, of course, so we have replaced them. I caught them on time, so the motherboard isn't damaged. I also think we snatched these RAM sticks from the Classic 2. But we'll take care of those in a future upgrade video. A regular Torx 15 is enough to get inside one of these machines. Unlike the Classic and Classic 2 that have the screws recessed inside the carrying handle. With four of those removed, we can now pull the lid off. While we tried to repair it the last time, the hard drive died. So we have replaced the hard drive too. Now let's disconnect the analog board. And I'll show you what we have done so far. Just a few connectors. 
The neck board is soldered to the analog board, so it has to be unplugged from the tube. And lastly, we have to disconnect the speaker back here. And now we can pull the logic board out together with the neck board. In the previous repair attempts, we found two diodes here that were so badly burnt, the paint had fallen off. We also have this cap here, sitting very very close to these two diodes. So I was pretty much sure that this was our problem. I replaced this cap and moved it slightly away from these diodes and replaced both of these diodes. I decided to solder the diodes away from the board so that's why they are standing up like this. On this side of the board we can see some more heat damage. The board has clearly been burning hot and the solder mask has started to peel off. So those were some pretty toasty diodes. I should also mention that when we took this machine apart we couldn't find any soot inside. And as you can see this machine is extremely clean. And that's not my doing, it actually came this clean. So that also tells us that this heat damage here occurred very early in the life of this machine. But apparently this cap here hadn't dried up from heat as I thought. And these diodes were still okay too. So my guess was wrong. This is not our issue. These Macs have a small design flaw. At the back here it has tons of pots for adjusting the CRT. They are all hiding away underneath this plastic cover here. At the back of the case the Mac has two holes for easy access to two of these pots. But for some weird reason the Mac is sucking in air and dust through these two holes. So two of these pots were completely filled up with dust. So the next thing we did was to clean out all the pots. Unfortunately that didn't make any difference. So the next step is to do what many of you have suggested and go for a full recap of the analog board. Let's start with these two here. Uh, these guys, they are completely soaked in glue. The reason why I didn't do a full recap right away is because I can't see any signs of leakage on this board and many of these caps are Nichicons. So it looks like it's in a great condition but apparently it's not. Okay, this one was really stubborn. Let's try with some fresh solder. No, that didn't help. Let's crank up the heat. No, that didn't work either. What a stubborn cap. Let's add some heat with the pine sill. Yeah, that did the trick. So these are Chemicon LXF. Let's see if we can pull them off the board. Someone was trigger happy with the glue. Well, I can't see any signs of leakage on these two. I'll save them for later. Uh, perhaps we'll check the condition. Well, we've got something on one of these caps. It looks like sticky dust. I can't really tell if that's cap juice or something else. These two guys here and a few other caps on this board are low ESR. So pay attention when you order caps for one of these boards. To make things a bit more tricky, some of the caps on this board with the same value has to be low ESR and some don't. So you may want to mark some of your caps before you start recapping. It's easy to make a mistake here. I guess I'll lay these two down. Like they were installed originally. Oh, this could be a problem. Because there is a diode here. And it may get toasty. So that could be a problem. I installed the board in the Mac and checked. Luckily there is enough clearance to have this cap here standing up. So I'll install one of them standing up and the other one laying flat. Okay, I found something interesting here. The Chemicon SXF with a green leg. I hope it shows up on camera. But these caps are not supposed to have green legs. 
So maybe we're onto something here. By the way, when I checked some lists online, there seems to be some variations to these boards. So I would be very careful using someone else's cap lists. Also, sometimes low ESR caps aren't specified on lists online. If you get one of the caps wrong, you could be in for a very long troubleshooting. So it could be totally worth it checking and measuring every cap yourself. It will take you an hour. Uh, it's a lot less than trying to find which cap is wrong when your machine isn't working. I am of course skipping ahead here because this board has about 50 caps. So this recap is pretty time consuming. But if it fixes the issue, it's totally worth it. For this project, I ordered a mix of Panasonic and Worth caps. But we still have some caps inside this can here. They are hidden away underneath this lid here. So make sure to order these if you're playing along. To replace those caps, we also need to remove this can underneath the PCB. Let's see how this works. Okay, that was easy. It just popped off. Well, there is something underneath this cap here. I'm not sure what it is. Also looks like sticky dust. Just like the other one. Don't know what it is. It's actually the same stuff under this cap here too. How strange, I've never seen this before. Okay, we're almost done now. Well, I wouldn't say it's a difficult recap. I only had to add some heat to some of the pads, but I didn't need to preheat the entire board. It was however incredibly time consuming. So many caps on this board. Uh, now to the fun part. Reassembling the system. Let's start with this lid here. I'm going to use slightly less glue on this cap here. Well, the end of March in Tosh also means spring. Don't know if the microphone picks it up, but birds are going absolutely bunkers outside. This cap here was also glued down, probably because it's so close to the tube. Well, there might be quite a lot of chirping birds in the background in this video. By the way, Mauser didn't have this large cap here, so I wasn't able to replace it. I'll leave a note on the machine that it hasn't been replaced. And I guess I'll try to source it elsewhere. The analog board sits on top of this large shield. It slides in place and then it's locked down with these two tabs. To make the installation easier, I taped the speaker cable at both ends to prevent it from falling down. Now let's get that analog board in the machine. Reconnect the neck board and a few connectors to the tube with the two audio connectors taped down. They are much easier to reconnect. And the microphone down here. Not that I'm ever going to use it. Okay, analog board reinstalled. If you're testing one of these machines without the lid on, Make sure you have a flat surface, otherwise this shield here could potentially short the motherboard. Now let's put that board in, connect the keyboard and mouse, and power. Okay, let's flip that switch and turn the machine on. Well, it still chimes. Hard drive is spinning, we are still getting something on the screen. We've got a cursor. And welcome to Macintosh. Okay, everything seems to work normally. I don't have a way of forcing that issue. So the only thing I can do is to leave the machine on. At least for a few hours and see if our problem is gone. But so far this is looking really good. Since we have to wait for a few hours before we can conclude whether this fixed the Color Classic or not, I decided to check all the caps. Turns out seven of them are way out of specs. So you guys were right. This board needed a recap. 
One of them is a Nichicon VX, and the rest of them are Chemicon SME. Let me check, I think they are. No, this one is an SMG. Uh, this one too. And these two are SME. The Nichicon was the worst of the bunch. It's a 100 microfarad, 25 volts. The ESR on this cap is about 2.1 ohms. It's supposed to be below 0.3. So that is many times worse than acceptable. And it was measuring about 50 microfarads instead of 100. The other caps weren't quite as bad, but way out of spec. While we wait some more, let's restore a SCSI drive. Because as I mentioned before, I want to use it to transfer files to the original hard disk 20, since it has a SCSI port and the older style diskette port. This drive is yellow and ugly and partially disassembled. So it's actually put together with some sticky tape. Hopefully all the screws are inside. Uh, let's pull that lid off. Yeah, that is a massive SCSI drive. This is old school for sure. So this is an ST225N. The power supply seems to be loose too. Oh, that's a bad sign. Someone has poked through the sticker here. So if I'm not mistaken, someone has been inside this drive. That's not a good start. It's not obvious how this drive comes out. But it looks like there is a plastic tab down here. So let's give that a try. Yeah, that was a good guess. Man, that drive is massive. Very classic connector. Just like in the Model F. This panel here with the connectors and the fan also seems to be held in place with the clip here. Luckily the plastics don't seem to have gone fragile on this drive. Well, it's a bit stuck, but I think it's coming off. Yep. So this is a hard disk 20SC, model number M2604Z. And it seems to be manufactured in January of 1987. So quite a bit older than the machines we are fixing today. There is also a smaller connector back here. That seems to be for the switch to choose the SCSI ID. Let's have a look in the power supply. Apparently it's manufactured by Sony in Japan. So probably a very good power supply. Aside from those screws, it also has some locking tabs. Okay, everything looks good inside here actually. It has one of those funny sticky rubber domes on the main cap. But there are no refus and no bulging caps. And thanks to the enclosure, it's quite clean inside here. Well, I'll clean and retrobrite everything off camera. And we'll test it out and see if it still works. Well, I decided to restore another one of these. And this drive here actually has a mini scribe, model number 84255A inside. And it seems to have been manufactured in December of 1989. So quite a bit newer drive. Well, we might as well fix this one too, while we're fixing SCSI drives. So this is a Rodime Systems 20 Plus. I think it's pretty much the same thing as Apple's offering. But the design looks a lot more like the hard disk 20. But it's obviously not, because it has SCSI connectors at the back here. This one is not put together with clips. Instead it has a couple of screws at the back here. I don't know if Rodime ever made any SCSI drives. I guess we'll find out in a few seconds. It's probably just a generic drive inside. Maybe there are some clips hiding away here. Not an easy drive to take apart. Yep, that seems to be the trick. Oh, dust bunnies are falling out. I'm gonna have to do some cleaning here. Oh man, that is dusty. That is pretty disgusting. And apparently a road I made SCSI drives too. Oh, look at these dust bunnies. That is disgusting. 
and we've got reefers. One, two, three, four reefers. And I wonder if there are more reefers hiding away inside this can here. Well, I'll do all the cleaning off camera and then we'll test it. Obviously, without those reefers. Well, we might as well just go all in. It's branded CMS and I think it's a clone of the 20SC. So it should be pretty much the same thing. This one is really rough and rusty. Three of the feeds are missing. And the only one left is actually taped down. So I wonder what drive we will find inside here. Uh, I guess we need to figure out how to take it apart. Okay, that seems to be an easy task. It just slides out from the case. Okay, yet another type of drive. This drive has an ST138N. So this is a slightly newer drive. There are no reefers, uh, no bulging caps. So this one just needs some cleaning. And we'll test it too. Okay, let's start with the ST225N. It looks exactly like the more famous ST225 that you may have seen in old IBMs and compacts. But obviously with one big difference. This is a SCSI drive. Let's start with the visual inspection. It's mounted to this large bracket here. So I'll remove it so we can take a closer look at the PCB. Uh, apparently that means we have to disconnect this cable here and the LED at the front because they are stuck to the brackets. Well, there wasn't much to see in here. Not even dust. So what I'm looking for are blown tantalums. Let's remove this PCB too. The PCB is held down with T10 screws. So let's remove them and take a look on the other side of the PCB. Okay, PCB is loose, but there are probably a bunch of cables and connectors. So I better go slow here. There's one connector accessible on this side here. Let's pull it off. Ah, that's what I was hoping for. We can now access the motor. Okay, let's spin that drive manually. That may give us a clue of the condition of this drive. Well, there was a tiny, tiny scratchy noise. But now it's dead silent. So maybe it's okay. Let's hope for the best. Okay, I did an inspection and I can't see anything wrong here. No blown tantalums. Okay, PCB back on and power connected. Let's do smoke tests. Here we go. Oh no. Well, the fan is spinning back here. But the hard drive, not so much. Oh, that sucks. Well, I guess there is a reason why someone has broken the seal here. Let's take a look inside and see how bad this is. I was really hoping this drive would work. I'm a bit disappointed. Nobody seems to care much about mechanical hard drives nowadays. But to me they are an important part of the nostalgia. So let's pry that lid off. And see what we will find inside. Oh, that doesn't look too bad. I was kind of expecting to see a disaster in here. But this looks okay. So maybe we have an electrical fault on this drive. I'll put the lid back on to keep the dust out. Because there might actually be hope for this drive. If it's one of the components on the PCB. And if that component is still available. We can actually fix this drive. Because the heads and platters kind of seemed okay. Well, I actually have two of these. So let's see if we have better luck with this one. Same procedure here. I'll disconnect the LED. And the cable that selects the ID. Well, same thing here. Just a small amount of dust. So let's remove that PCB. And see if this drive moves freely. Without making any noises. Well, this board has a proper cap here. Unlike the bodge cap on the other board. Otherwise they look identical. So I'm going to leave that PCB on. 
Okay, let's have a listen. Oh, it's dead silence. I can't hear any noise. But there is some dust here, so I'll just clean that off. Okay, fingers crossed. Let's see if this drive spins up. It certainly does. And it sounds really good. Well, the cool nostalgic sounds don't start until it starts seeking. So let's turn it off and connect it to a Mac. Okay, hooked up to the Classic 2. Let's turn the hard drive on first. And then turn the Mac on. Well, the drive doesn't pop up on the display. Man, that thing is noisy when it's outside its case. Let's see if this helps. Okay, let's try HDSC setup. I hope the microphone doesn't pick up too much of that noise. Well, I can only see SCSI device 0, but not the external drive. Well, that sucks. Well, I did a whole bunch of tests and made sure that drive ID and termination was correctly set. I also tested the power supply for drive number 2 here and made sure it was working. I then tried this drive here with the power supply from drive number 2. So we know we had good power when testing both drives. But I'm not ready to recycle these drives quite yet because it seems to me that we have faulty components on the PCB on these drives. So I'm going to put them aside and perhaps we'll do some troubleshooting and see if we're lucky. That brings us to the mini scribe. So let's remove that bracket and take a look underneath and check for obvious issues before we test this drive. Well, everything looks okay on the PCB. So let's remove this PCB and see if we can turn that drive manually. That means disconnecting all these connectors and hopefully we'll have better luck with this drive than with the mini scribe in the Canon projects. So let's turn that motor. It's dead silent. Okay, great. Let's put a few drops of machine oil on the stepper motor just in case it has dried up. I'm gonna leave it like this for a few minutes and let that oil sink in before we do the test. Okay, it's been a few minutes. Let's see if this drive spins up. It does. And it sounds pretty good. The stepper motor isn't moving, but that's probably because it's not hooked up to the Mac. So let's try that next. Okay, so the system is using ID7, and the internal hard drive is using ID0. So I have disconnected the internal hard drive and set the ID to 0 on this drive instead. Let's see if this works. Okay, the stepper motor is moving and it sounds good. I have disk tools 753 on the diskette. This drive, by the way, is a lot less noisy than ST225N. Oh yes, here's our drive. I think we have a working drive here. So that brings us to the road dime. The power supply was so dusty, I didn't notice that these two caps here were leaking like crazy. I have obviously washed this power supply, so the juice is gone. But if the camera picks it up, you should be able to see that these caps are bulging. So this is what we'll do. I'll order some caps. And this drive here will return when we restore the Mac Plus. Because unlike the original Apple drive, the Rodime enclosure actually matches the Mac Plus. So then we only have the CMS branded ST138N. I'm not going to restore this drive today. I just want to test and see if it works. Because I think I'm going to use the parts from this drive to repair one of the original Apple drives instead. Okay, PCB looks good. But to remove it, we need to remove these brackets. So that's what we'll do. I'll leave all the connectors on, 
So let's turn on this drive and have a listen. Well, it was actually stuck, but it didn't make any noises. It's dead silent. Okay, great. Since we're not going to reuse that enclosure, let's test this drive hooked up directly to the Classic 2 here. Fingers crossed. Okay, it spun up very quickly compared to the other drives. Yes, it's a working drive. And apparently it was used as a backup drive back in 1997. The drive had some folders with the names of the previous owners. So I moved it out of sight. But that is definitely a working drive. I guess my strategy to buy many to get a few working is probably the way to go with these old drives. I only had time to retrobrite one of the cases. So only the mini scribe is finished. Now let's try this. I have connected the first type of Apple drive to the old style connector and the newer SCSI drive to the classic too. Let's see if this works. This is gonna get noisy with three vintage drives turned on at the same time. Yeah, that totally works. So here's the contents of the old drive. I use these for the first generation Compact Max that don't have a SCSI connector, like the 512K. Here's the internal drive, and here's the mini scribe. This drive is not restored yet, so it's really yellow and ugly, but that's for another day. Oh no! I was just about to record the outro. But the Color Classic is misbehaving again. The image is way too bright. It looks like it has turned up the game. I had it running for an hour earlier and it was working perfectly. But not anymore. Well, seven of the caps were bad. So it needed a recap. But the glitchy display is caused by something else. Uh, I guess we'll try again in another video. Suggestions are more than welcome. If you're watching this in the future, there will be a link to that video on the screen shortly. If you're watching this fresh, hit the bell icon below and set it to all. And that was a good time to watch this video. I will end by saying thank you to my patrons, I appreciate your support. If you want to support me too, consider becoming a patron. Patrons get ad free early access. If you want to help me make more videos like this, like and leave a comment. If you're a regular viewer, consider subscribing to this channel. Thank you for watching, I'll see you next week.